And uh, I want to welcome the, care, the chair, um, Con Gildenew, and um, Orlea are both uh, watching via the live stream and will email questions to the clerk following the briefings, which the clerk will put on their behalf. So I want to remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. And um, we are going to move straight to apologies. And I have no apologies received. Have members any apologies to report? No, thank you. Okay, and uh, we'll straight into chairperson's business. And um, I just want to make some remarks at the start of the meeting. At the outset, I want to express my sympathy on behalf of this committee to all of the friends and families of those whose lives have been cut short because of coronavirus and the worldwide, the worldwide health crisis that we find ourselves in. It's soul-destroying to think that uh, these comments will become the absolute norm for a prolonged period of time, while we watch and hear of many, many others who will be plunged into grief. It is right and proper that we take this opportunity once again to appeal to our community to behave in the only way that will save lives and say again, stay at home, wash your hands and keep your distance. This is probably the single most stressful time in all of our lifetime to date, but we have the power to change the numbers of lives lost. I also think it's appropriate that the public understand that this assembly is a shadow of its former self, and rightly so with the skeleton staff, with most working remotely, and many measures put in place to ensure that we adhere to the government instruction to order uh, or, and to be physically, socially distanced from each other this time. So I just want to welcome Colin McGrath to his first um, health meeting today, um, and also mention that the chair uh, did an interview with Radio Foil on Tuesday. I also want to record the committee's appreciation of the Minister's announcement of, of further contaminated blood payments, particularly given the pressures that the Minister is under, and just let you know that the statement is included under correspondence. So, uh, moving on to the draft minutes, I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of March, which are tab 3.1 of the meeting pack, and ask if the, min if the members are content with the minutes. Great. Attempts, thank you. Um, okay, and so on to matters arising. There are no matters arising. And that takes us straight into item six, which is COVID-19 disease response, departmental briefing on surge planning. So I want to advise members that the minister and the chief medical officer are joining us by Skype to discuss the surge plan and latest developments. We have reordered the agenda to accommodate the Minister's urgent dairy commitments. And I want to just at this point welcome the Minister, Robin Swan, and Chief Medical Officer Michael McBride. Thank you for being here today via Skype, gentlemen. Um, Thank you, Chair. I refer members to papers at tab six of the pack and tab six of table papers, which includes yesterday's letter from Community Pharmacy NI and the Minister's announcements regarding primary care COVID-19 centres, pharmacy funding and car parking charges for HSC workers. There's also a briefing note on PPE and testing provided by RAISE. So again, I want to welcome the Minister and Dr Michael McBride to um, our meeting today and invite the Minister and the Chief Medical Officer to brief us at this time and then we'll ask you some questions. Thank you. Um, yeah. First of all, can I thank you for your comments on opening the committee, um, especially in regards to the condolences and support to those who have lost their lives. And I think you are right um, in regards to the frequency and the seriousness um, that such announcements will be made. But your guidance and your opening words in regards to asking people to be responsible by taking their, their actions and how they can actually prevent the further spread of COVID-19 are, are well made and one, some that can't be rehearsed often enough. Um, the, the, title of, the title of this, uh, I think, presentation is actually to talk about our storage plan. Uh, we launched that uh, about a fortnight ago into where we thought we would be moving between the middle of March to the middle of April. At that point, I made it clear that uh, this would be a live document 
So there's things in this this search plan that have moved on. We've developed. We've delivered, and we're now looking at the further further iterations. Um, in regards to some of the points that, that, that were covered, um, I visited our first COVID-19 centre uh, that was opened in Alton Galvin yesterday. It's a, it's a new and a bit, new, and a, new, and a, new, new approach uh, as to how we're actually going to support um, patients of COVID-19. It's been developed by co-production through GPs, Health and Social Care Trust, Western Trust, uh, pharmacy, as, um, as it's the National Health Service working at its best together. What it'll actually enable is people with COVID, COVID symptoms, when, when they can contact their GP initially, if they can be triaged and the symptoms are, are low enough that self-isolation work, they can do that. If they're severe enough, they will still be taken to hospital, but if they're not mid-range, these COVID-19 centres will allow people to present, be checked by a GP, have access to medication there and then, and also then be triaged either recommendation to go home or straight into hospital. I would emphasise that the Chief Medical Officer said yesterday in the, in the media brief, they're, they're not testing centres. Um, but look, uh, as our testing capacity increases, there, there may be an opportunity for using the MADNAT. And a number of other concerns I think that has been raised was in regards to, to PPE. Um, we released at, at the beginning of the week 30% uh, of our pandemic stock, which will make up a large or, or, or fill a large gap that we had in, in, in our flow. We've, we've also made, made a number of changes as to how PPE is managed across the health and social care system. Previously, it was it was ordered at ward level. We've now brought in one uh, one point of contact in each trust, so that can be managed and coordinated. Um, at this moment in time, we're we're seeing and hearing concerns that are being raised by the social and domiciliary care workers, um, who previously would have sourced their own PPE, um, but would have sought backup uh, stocks from from the trusts. Um, th there is a pinch point in supply there. It's something that we're alive to. It's something we're working very, very strenuously to, 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 to solve in that supply chain. But it's also... Sorry, I've just had a note. Um, can you just mute me here, Because I'm getting feedback here. I'm, I'm hearing myself talking to me. We can try and get that sorted out later. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, just in, re in regards to, to that PPE, um, what we're trying to address is the concern, and it's a genuine concern of those working in our service, that they don't have the correct PPE or access to the stock. At this moment in time, our supply chain and our stock is such that it is there, it is available. We do have to work a bit harder in making sure it's in the right place at the right time. But what we're doing as well is reinforcing to people of the usage of PPE to use the right grade at the right time in the right circumstance. And we're being guided by this uh, through WHO guidance on PPE in regards to COVID-19. Um, we've put out a number of guidance uh, and support documentation through through our, our entire sector, through dom domiciliary care, through your home care practice. Our, our, our care home providers as well. Um, we're reinforcing that. We'll put it out again. Our chief nurse is doing a number of educational videos as to how to wear PPE, what's the right point to use it, and when to use it. Um, that guidance is in place. I, I've shared it with executive colleagues this, this morning before coming on to, to meet yourselves. I'll share that with you now. So if we can get that information out, it'll, it'll help to... I think alleviate concerns that people people have um, because they are genuine fears. Look, I, I, everyone in Northern Ireland is apprehensive to some level as to where this goes at this moment in time, and, and rightly so. 
Um, so that that's where we are in PPE. Sorry, Chair, had you anything else? Um, I suppose, and well, we can just go straight to questions if if you wish, unless I, unless yeah, look, I look. We were good enough in this myself and the Chief Medical Officer here thought it would be, be better if we actually came and answered questions from yourself um, rather than putting in officials. Um, so, fire away. Okay, thank you. So, um, I suppose I'll, I'll start with testing, Minister. I mean, we know that um, the testing is being ramped up um, and that uh, hopefully we'll get to around 1,100 per day soon. There is um, a lot of concern that, that that still isn't enough and that frontline health workers and also key workers need to be able to access testing. And we've seen uh, in terms of um, community pharmacy, uh, advice as of Tuesday that 30% of pharmacy workforce were in self-isolation and that the sector was close to collapse. So we obviously have many people who are concerned that either they're not protecting themselves or not protecting others in their very key, very vital workplace. Um, that is a big concern. And I've also had, uh, well, there was a, a Belfast Telegraph article around PSNI officers being told that they had to work on even though they knew they had come into contact with uh, possible COVID-19 cases and uh, they don't have PPE. So it's just some guidance on, on all of those things would be appreciated just to start off with. Right. I, I, have, I, haven't, I haven't thought of the, the PFNI um, article, but I'll certainly follow that up with the with the Minister of Justice and see what we need to see what we need to do there. In regards to, to our ramping up of, of testing, um, you know, in January there was no test for COVID-19. Uh, the scientific word moved very fast to get that capacity and that test built up. Uh, here locally, we've moved to 600. As you said, Chair, we intend to move to 1100 by early next week. Some of that will be based on trust. Um, we're also working with Public Health England as part of a national procurement on commercial testing. And as soon as we've sort of completed the evaluation of those tests, we'll, we'll see how that, that rolls out. That is, is, a key, is a key we want to use. Again, it's another tool um, that, that we have to, have to use. But the tests are, are based on a number of key areas and where we utilise our, our current capacity. The first are for those who are in hospital um, with other or underlying medical conditions uh, and present with COVID-19, because we need to identify those people who are in our health and social care system so they can receive the best treatment that they, we can provide. The, the second group are those who are in clustered or um, gripping um, accommodation. So old people's homes, prisons, um, those, those centres for special educational needs, um, so that if there's somebody that identifies in there, we can get that cluster tested to make sure it doesn't become a, a larger a larger area. Uh, the third group and then is our health and social care workers, because it's, it's vital that we get them back to, to work as soon as possible to support support those key individuals. Um, so that, that group that group does include a, a, a number of key workers. It includes uh, PHE. When I met community pharmacy on Tuesday, uh, they raised the same issue with me. And look, they're part of the healthcare family. And that's what I told them, and that's the commitment I gave them. So, so there, they will be part of that process as we run by your testing, because the, the only way we tackle this is by, is by working together. Um, I'll just ask the Chief Medical Officer to come in if he wants to. Yeah, I, I, Chair, Deputy Chair, Minister, thank you, members. Uh, I think that's your way that I can summarize the current position. Um, I think we need to. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Uh, just to say that we've checked at this end, nothing can be done at our end about the sound quality. So if somebody wants to check at the Minister's end, if something can be done about the sound quality, but also you're very faint, I understand your distance from the minister, unless you want to swap. 
I'm going to do so. Thank you. Uh, just to say that I mean, I think it's important that we keep all in mind that this is a virus that as of the 10th of December of last year, we didn't know existed. It hadn't made the jump from uh, from bats through perhaps an alien host into humans. Uh, we are now in a situation as where next week we will be testing an excess of 1,100 um, a day uh, with, with plans to ramp that up at a national level uh, over coming days and weeks. The Minister's indicated uh, there are ongoing discussions with a range of partners, commercial partners, to make those tests available. What we need to be absolutely certain is the verification, validation and quality control of those tests um, and also to ensure that we're prioritising those use, as the Minister said, first and foremost for uh, to guide clinical decision making for those who are sick and ill, uh, to investigate and manage outbreaks and also to ensure that we get our frontline healthcare workers and in due course other uh, critical uh, workers back into the workplace as quickly as is possible. We cannot uh, test where we do not have test capacity uh, at present. Our proportion of tests are equivalent to any part of these islands in terms of the numbers of tests that we're doing per head of the population and also the turnaround time. Uh, equally, it's no point conducting a test, taking a sample, and people waiting for weeks for the result. Uh, that defeats the purpose. Um, we need to be clear that as we move through different phases of this, this uh, epidemic, pandemic, as testing comes online, we will use our testing in different ways. Um, so, for instance, if indeed the social distancing, which is so, so important, if people follow that advice, the modelling suggests that we will ever be able to pull down the peak and our health services should be able to cope. If that is the case, and as testing ramps up, then we can begin to use our testing capacity in different ways. And we've had discussions about community testing and making that more widely available. I would just also want to add finally, before concluding, that we are seeing new tests come online very rapidly. We include tests for the virus itself, the so-called antigen tests, but also very importantly, antibody tests. Those are tests which will tell us what proportion of the population have had the virus, may have had a very mild illness or may not have had any symptoms at all, but have actually developed immunity to it. And that's crucially important because if we can begin to test critical uh, frontline staff across all sectors and determine that already a high proportion of them have immunity uh, to the virus, then they are safe to go back into the workplace uh, and safe to work with uh, patients and other members of the public. So I think over the next couple of weeks, we will see a step change, uh, not only in our testing here in Northern Ireland, our capacity, but also at a UK level. That's very welcome. Uh, thank you. And can, can I don't know whether you, Michael, or the Minister would want to update us on the expert testing advisory group? Yes, the, the Minister has announced uh, from uh, last week that we were establishing an expert advisory group that comprises uh, scientists, virologists, um, expert um, uh, clinicians here in Northern Ireland working with their counterparts uh, in Public Health England. Again, accessing all of the evaluation of the currently available commercial tests and those coming online. And then uh, that expert advice will be providing advice to myself and then to the Minister about the suitability of those tests. But as Minister said, I think it's important that uh, to emphasise that we are taking a UK approach to this, because clearly our combined uh, efforts is crucially important at a time like this, as the, uh, as the Deputy Chair has mentioned. We're also very, working very, very closely uh, with our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland uh, as well. Okay, thank you. We're just going to move to um, questions. Is it for Michael or for the Minister? Um, <coughs> either. Uh, I, I think the, we're going to go straight to the Chair who's um, working remotely. So the, the, the Clerk is going to read his questions. 
Right, so, uh, so this question is from Colm and the clerk is reading it off. To ask the Minister or the Chief Medical Officer how many testing centres are being put in place, where they'll be located and when they'll be operational. Second question, uh, could he assure the committee that areas west of the ban will be sufficiently provisioned and that historic underinvestment will not be compounded in the crisis by basing current plans too rigidly on existing services? Uh, in regards to the second question, yes, we will be, testing will be done equitably across Northern Ireland as and where we see the, see the need. In, in regards to the first, we're, we're not at a point where we're going to open those, I suppose, community testing sites. Where, we're, where our focus is at this minute in time is on our COVID-19 centres. So we're getting that frontline support to those people who are presenting with that mid-range uh, symptom of COVID-19. So as, as to move for, the, for the, the, the community tent, we're not on that stage yet because we, we still don't have that capacity. Okay. okay, we're just checking for any more questions from Colin before we... Um, yeah. did, did the Minister answer the West of the Band question? He sort of did at the start there. He says it's going to be testing across Northern okay. Ireland. Okay. Right. So the next question. Uh, well, there's, there, 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 there's, no, there's no geographic disparity in any service that I provide. Um, the second test is a comment on the question. Uh, the chair refers to the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control and their uh, multiple rapid risk assessment for COVID 19. The most recent, he says, is from the 25th of March and states, quotes, shortages in testing capacity need to be anticipated and addressed, taking the needs for testing of other <coughs> critical diseases into account. If capacity is exceeded, priority should be given to the testing of vulnerable patients, healthcare workers, and patients requiring hospitalisation. So the question is, are you aware of the ECDC publications and would you agree with their assessment on testing? If so, what capacity would we need per day to meet those ECDC recommendations uh, if they're prioritised? Sorry, those ECDC guidance are, are, are the, the, the recommendations and guidance that we work through. As we said at the start, that there are, our criteria for testing is those who are, in who are being hospitalised and present with a medical condition, we test test everyone, you know, those people in hospital to make sure we can treat patients with COVID-19 as a priority, but also make sure those who don't are not in the same vicinity that they will pick up infection. So we're actually meeting that EC, ECDC guidance. Uh, we actually go a step further, then we go into the clustering and then we go into our, our own healthcare professionals. So so we're in, we're in line and in tune with that. In regards to capacity, we are increasing our capacity or, or which will meet the, the conditions that we've laid down in the specifications uh, of groups that we are actually testing at this moment in time because we want to go farther. Uh, just, to, just to add, add to that, that obviously ministers across the United Kingdom uh, are advised by respective chief medical officers. We are working very closely together. We have the benefit of some of the best scientists and clinicians uh, in, the, uh, in these islands. We have also the benefit of the scientific advisory group on emergencies, which is looking at all the modeling evidence, all of the science. And we have the combined uh, resources of the Public Health England, our public health agency uh, in Northern Ireland, Health Protection Scotland, and uh, Public Health Wales. And on the basis of that, has informed our approach uh, to testing. That has informed our approach to containment, which has been successful and delayed the spread of this virus, the delay phase, and all of the work that we're un undertaking. Um, what you've outlined in terms of ECDC uh, surveillance uh, and update on, on testing is now, it seems very closely aligned with what we've been doing for quite some time. Okay. move on to some of the members questions Alex yeah thank you minister um, I want to say thank you about the car parking charges for staff that you lifted so well done for that um, in terms of protection gear I have had a few complaints from staff from sort of like the private sector that uh, nursing homes are not supplying the gear as quick as they could or 
or not is what they're being recommended. Um, is, is somebody keeping a close eye on the private sector uh, nursing homes and stuff like that to try and make sure that they're, they're following suit? Yeah, and I think Alex, as I said, I said in my open comment that there seems to be a, a supply uh, delay in regards from our trust into the independent sector. It's something we're alive to, something we're working on to address um, just to make sure we get that flow. But it's also critical that everyone across the sector is using the appropriate PPE at the correct time. So we've re emphasised and reissued that guidance as to what is the appropriate PPE to use in the situation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share that with the committee so you, you can have access to it. And we are following WHO, World Health Organization guidance, on what is the appropriate PPE to use in the correct circumstance. And, and that guidance has been developed by the WHO in response to how different countries have reacted to COVID-19 and what they see as needs be, being necessary. So this is actually evidence-led um, from the WHO professionals. Uh, but I, I think the important thing is, is for those independent care sectors to make sure they not just don't have the PPE, but they also have the reassurance and the guidance that they're using the correct PPE in the right situation and at the right time. Um, next, oh, you want then, Michael? No. Good. Oh, right. Okay, I thought you were waving at me. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> the next question is. Um, do the public health agency have a role in making sure that those companies that are working are keeping to the rules in terms of making sure that staff are two metres apart? Because I'm, I'm get, getting quite a few complaints about that as well. About uh, thanks, Minister. Um, there is... Um, Public Health Agency has produced guidance, which is on their website. The guidance is quite clear that um, where possible, individuals should be working from home. Where that is not possible, the general rules around social distancing and hand hygiene need to be, uh, need to be followed. Uh, obviously, companies need to be uh, creative in the current circumstances as to how they apply those and the the uh, ship patterns, rotor patterns and distancing perhaps on uh, production lines, etc. But we also need to see this in the, in the broader context. Um, the Deputy First Minister, or First Minister and Deputy First Minister have issued a clear uh, advice on this in terms of their expectations, in terms of non-essential uh, work uh, proceeding. I think it's also important that we see this in the longer term. Uh, unfortunately, as the Deputy Chair mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we have sadly seen, seen loss of life. We are going to see in the coming weeks numbers of deaths increase, and the rate of those deaths increase as well. Um, and that is a significant loss. Our priority throughout all of this is to, to reduce mortality, both direct mortality from the virus itself, but indirect mortality because our health service is overwhelmed. And that's why, as the uh, Deputy Chair emphasised at the outset, the importance of the message is stay at home, avoid unnecessary travel, uh, and to adhere to the rules around uh, social distancing. But we also need to remember that poverty kills people too. And that's why it's important that we maintain the balance between ensuring that any impact on our wider economy in the longer term does not significantly disadvantage those who are often already most socioeconomically disadvantaged. Uh, so there is a balance here. Nothing trumps the saving a life, and that's why adhering to the public health agency's advice to employers and social distancing and our general advice to the public is so important because that will pull down the peak. Uh, it will protect our health service and allow us to provide optimal care. But we also need to um, be clear that in the medium to longer term, that we need to ensure that what we don't do is collapse the economy and end up with those in the most socioeconomic deprived areas uh, suffering the consequences. We know the very strong links 
that we have to a number of physical uh, issues and health issues, but also uh, longer term mental health issues. Um, and to say any steps that we take around social distancing are likely to be put in place for quite some time. And we need to think about the sustainability of that. Thank you. Um, just another two quickies. <laughs> um, we're talking about um, testing kits, um, and there was stuff on the news the other night about their different testing kits. They're, they're not saying that you've got the illness right now, it's that you've actually had it. Um, is there any plans for those to be coming? here or, or to be made available in some way or do, or do we know anything about that? We do, it's one of the things, it's one of the things the expert group in testing is actually looking at. Um, so what, when that national contract comes online, we'll be, we'll be part of it. But one thing that I, I suppose is important to stress about testing and especially that antigen testing, um, we can't stress enough that being tested and have a certificate that you have been tested is not a certificate of immunity. Because there's a real danger there if somebody comes through, you know, has a test. I'm you no, know, it's like an MOT. You could be tested at four o'clock this afternoon and not have COVID 19. By five o'clock, you could have it. So a test does not give you immunity from, from this, this virus. The last thing. Um... Have you any numbers on volunteers that have contacted you about helping out? Uh, in regards to, to, to volunteers, that's been handled by the Department of Communities. Um, I think they're actually working in conjunction with the, with the Red Cross. Um, one of the things that our trust has, our trusts across Northern Ireland is that they, they have a good body of volunteers uh, that they can draw on, but we're supplementing that by by what the Department of Community has drawn in through their online their online call that's been done through the executive office. Where we will see a need for, for those volunteers stepping up and it's a you know it's a call I'll put out to sporting clubs, to voluntary organizations, um, to churches. Um, when we issue the letter to the, the 40, 40, 000 odd people that would be asking to shield themselves. They will need assistance. They'll need assistance with food deliveries. They'll need assistance with people collection prescription for them from pharmacy, because we're very conscious of the pressure that it could put in community pharmacy of an expectation of delivery. That that's not what is envisaged here. It's about those people who are shielding where they can, when they can, to ask friends, family, and neighbours, and community organisations actually to support them while they're shielding. Because what we have to be very clear in our messaging to these people that we're asking to shield, we don't want them to be isolated from the community. We want them to be shielded from the virus. Mister, that's a, a very good point. And just on, on the back of that, can you be very clear about where people, because there are so many people who want to volunteer in so many different ways, where do they go to? And will the Department of Communities then be setting up um, uh, uh, like a helpline, such as that we see, uh, like the NHS helpline in England. Will that be set up through Department of Communities um, in line with or in cooperation with a, a big charity such as Red Cross to ensure that that we actually collate all that all, all those offers of help and that that that, that help is um, is made the best of and and also. Um, we've heard this morning in terms of ventilators that Dyson are, are going to make a very large number of, of ventilators um, and I, I'm just wondering are any of those ventilators um, earmarked to come to Northern Ireland? Again, sorry, I'll go. Uh, in regards to the ventilators and Dyson, um, we're, we're part of, there's a UK supply, we're part of the UK so we get our, our proportion as, as is necessary to that. We have 650 ventilators currently on their way at, at less than a minute in time, so those have already been ordered. Um, 100 mechanical ventilators, 350 non-invasive, and three airvo. Um, so those are on stage, and our procurement along the CPD uh, and the Department of Finance are looking on purchasing ventilators. 
but it's not just about buying the machine. It's making sure we have the people who can operate them and actually utilize them so they produce uh, the correct support that the patient needs at that minute, minute in time. In regards to where people uh, volunteer and the connection they made, the First Minister uh, launched a website in a, a connection yesterday afternoon. Um, I, I don't have the detail just in front of me, Deputy Chair, but I'll get it to you. Okay, thank you. And um, the last one from me for now is about um, a call from, we heard it in the media this morning, but a lot of people in different areas of work life who are wanting to donate what they have in terms of PPE and you know is it would that be useful and would there be drop-off points that can be um, identified that people can actually donate what they have and maybe people who are, who are not able to work at the moment say for instance a beautician who wants to donate her gloves or hairdressers who want to donate their gloves to other uh, key workers who could make good use of those. And also there was a call for, I think from nurses, who were calling for baby monitors if people were finished with them. Um, that would be another thing that would be great if that was useful to those nurses in carrying out this, their, their vital work, if there could be a drop-off point that people could actually help to provide those baby monitors to the health service workers. I saw that call tonight myself this morning, Vice Chair. Um, we're working on to how you best utilise uh, that information, but we also have to, uh, or that offer of supply of, of equipment. But we need to be sure uh, of the validity of the supply chain of it as well. And that if anything that comes to us to be used has been properly sanitised, that there's no risk of infection or cross contamination from where, where it has been before. So. Where, where those offers are very, very welcome, we have to make sure that they're not also adding an additional layer of concern um, to those who are using them or those who make, make use of them. So it's something something that became aware of at half eight this morning and something we're looking at. Okay, and you'll you'll come back to us on that, I'm sure. I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair, sorry, can I, can I just indicate... Um, we had an hour with you this morning, so half eleven. I have an executive meeting following this. Okay, all right. We'll move on to Jerry. Uh, thanks, Minister uh, Chief Medical Officer. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. So I'll be quick. A um, couple of quick points. Uh, PPE. Um, I'm in contact by a lot of people um, about the lack of or non-existence of PPE. I'm sure they're members of the same. Uh, care workers, you don't have any. Uh, people in hospices, you don't have any or it's, very, it's running low. People who uh, produce food, uh, who are at the, basically at the end of uh, masks and other equipment. So that, that's very concerning. I want to ask, is there a plan to ensure more is uh, um, spread out and given uh, to people? Um, testing as well. Um, I think I heard you correct, Minister, the COVID centres don't provide testing, if I picked you up correctly there. I mean, is there a plan to introduce drive-in testing centres? I think there's at least 61 in the south at the minute, so I think we're, we're way behind uh, on that, and we need to rapidly increase testing, generally speaking, but um, drive-in testing centres is a quick and one of the safest ways of um, making it happen. So what is the plan, if any, on, on that? Um, just two final quick points. Um, uh, ventilators, I'm concerned we don't have enough ventilators. Um, we have one for every 10,000 people here. Uh, in the US, we have one for every 3,700 people. And obviously, if you see the scenes in New York, you know um, America is ill-equipped uh, for all sorts of reasons to, to deal with this crisis. So I'm concerned that we don't have enough ventilators. Uh, there's a company in the south of Ireland that creates a lot of them. Um, and I raised this uh, in the chamber the other day. Is there a plan to Requisition takeover to uh, get a, a bigger increase uh, of ventilators. That would be something that I would be very, very keen uh, to see happen. And finally, I know there's uh, rules around student nurses. Um, I think it's six months. If you, if you have, your, if your course is finished in six months, uh, you can essentially work in the health service and support people. As far as I understand, uh, there's people that have contacted me who have nine months or ten months left um, in terms of their their course. Is there, you know, we want to make sure people are, are sort of well trained and well equipped uh, to to work in the health service um, if they're able to. But is there a 
plan to sort of slightly relax that six months to extend it out because it might uh, bring in an extra couple hundred or at least couple of thousand nurses. Um, so appreciate answers on that. No, um, Gary, I, I touched on some of them last week, medical officer, just to come in. In regards to the people who, as I said earlier on, we're working hard to make sure that people understand the PPE they need at the correct place and time. We are seeing a pressure point in the supply chain between our trusts and some of the private care home providers and some of the private domiciliary care providers. We're working to address that. Uh, that's why I released uh, the 30% of our pandemic stuff to make sure that flow was there. We're also making sure that that's been supplemented by, by purchasing from across across the world as we see supply chains even in China starting to open, open up again. Um, and again, we're part, we're part of the UK, the UK purchasing farm. Uh, in regards to the ventilators, we are out across, we're out across the world. We're looking everywhere to get the ventilators that, that we need, but also to make sure that we have the people um, who can use them. So that's why in the, in the surge plan, and you're starting to see some of, some of our elective care and probably more so in, in the coming days, actually starting to turn down some of those procedures. So we can profile areas and train up people so when we need them to be in that critical care situation that they have the, the skills to do that. In regards to the nursing students, we brought our nursing students forward that six months so they could still be um, at the stage in their training where they, they can be utilised on wards safely with supervision. Uh, we haven't, um, I, I don't think, at this minute in time, we're looking to relax that below the six months. Um, but at some point, if it's necessary, we will look at that. Uh, in regards to, the, to those students, you know, if they want to volunteer in, in any situation, we will support them and look to how we can best utilise them to do that. Uh, it is correct, we don't, we're, we're not able to use the COVID centres for testing at this minute in time because of the capacity, but it's something that we we intend, we intend looking at the drive-in centres is not something we've explored uh, because of the capacity we currently have, but if, if needs must and we get the opportunity to do it, we'll look at how we can do it in the community. It might not be drive-in, but yes, we may look at another function. Just to, thank you, Minister. Um, right, just to say that in terms of testing, the safest thing to do now is follow the advice and the advice is that if you have symptoms to self-isolate, household isolation, social distancing, testing won't beat this virus. Testing is not a magic bullet. What we need to do is to follow the public health advice which is out there around self-isolation, household isolation, social distancing, hand hygiene. That's how we will beat this virus and pull down the poop so our health service will cope. Where we need to prioritization, uh, prioritize testing, and I, I repeat this, has to be in managing people who are sick. Those who have got pneumonia in our hospitals, those who are in intensive care, ensuring that from an infection prevention control perspective, that, that we prevent spread and outbreaks within our hospitals. That's crucially important. That has to be our priority. Our next priority has to be getting frontline health and social care workers back into work to maintain services. That is our priority. When we get to the next phase of this, uh, of this pandemic, if indeed people adhere to the very important message the Deputy Chair mentioned at the outset around social distancing, we will see the re reproductive value. That's the number of people that are infected for, for each person that is infected fall below one. That's, that's our aim, is to pull that down from currently about two and a half to below one. If we can achieve that, then we will get a handle on this. Our health service will be able to cope. And as we ramp up our testing capacity, then we can begin to use our testing in different ways, including some of the approaches uh, that you have suggested. And we have to think through very carefully uh, how we do that, where we do that. But as I say, our priority at this time must be on preparing our health services to deal with the pressures, treating the sick and managing them, and ensuring that we get our frontline staff back into work uh, for those who are currently self-isolating at home with family. 
We have uh, introduced a, a protocol for testing of staff. We are currently set, setting, testing staff. As we said, in coming weeks, that will rapidly uh, escalate in terms of our capacity uh, to do that. We're absolutely committed to upping our testing capability and using it appropriately at different uh, phases of this pandemic. Just in relation to ventilators, uh, just to reassure you, as Minister said already, we're plugged into UK wide procurement and our business service organisation, with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland is also plugged into uh, the company in Galway that you referred to. Uh, in terms of nursing students, our chief nursing officer is also engaged with universities around second year uh, nursing students who obviously have um, less experience and training, but nonetheless, as Minister has said, uh, can volunteer in certain roles uh, to provide uh, support, uh, supportive care. We have Colin, Alan and Paula all indicating that they want to ask questions and we are aware that we are running out of time. Minister, can I just ask at this point, would it be possible, and we don't want to burden you any more than you already are, but we have many, many questions. Would there be any way that we could collate questions um, amongst this committee um, and ask if we could send them through to you even for even through uh, for a written answer or if, if somebody else from the department could even come back next week and brief us or answer some of our questions because they're very important questions. We understand we've no other way to ask these questions um, and it's just a difficult time. So, um, the, the Chair, Chair, look, possibly if it's helpful, if you, if you could get those questions um, I'll come back for an hour next week again. That would be good. I can get those questions to us. It means we, we can... Look, I have to be... I have to be I'll, I'll be frank and I'll be honest with you. Um, in regards to the questions that come through, they may change. The answers may have changed by the time you ask them and we get them to you. So I have to be conscious of the usage of time of my staff. But if, 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 if we can get a, as a big a head up to the, the questions that we can, and if you can keep them to a minimum, Chair, I would appreciate that as well. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that, Colin. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister and Chief Medical Officer, and I echo the condolences that you uh, passed earlier to the families of the bereaved. Uh, and also just to extend thanks to the whole healthcare family who are working exceptionally hard at this time, and that's very, very welcome. Just uh, a couple of points which I'll roll into one. Um, I'm going to say the PPE, 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 because, Minister, it, the inboxes are full, and I feel that somehow or another, as MLAs, we are like so, uh, the meat in a sandwich. Um, the executive is telling us that the stuff is there, but the people on the ground are telling us that it's not. So I think it's important if we can keep that communication open so that the people on the ground that are at the coal face get the services that they need, but they are telling us in large numbers at the minute that they're not. Um, and I don't uh, discount the word that you're saying that it's there, but we just need to iron that out because there is an anomaly and it's very, very important. There is evidence from testing that's been done in Germany that has kept the numbers down low. So I would just keep saying if we can ramp up the testing, if we know who has the illness, then we can isolate them and stop the further spread of it. Um, I think to just simply be one of the very few countries in the world that's not gone down the line of testing is a bit worrying. And I mean that across the whole of the UK. Um, there's some worrying uh, uh, remarks this morning that uh, in the UK we're not recording deaths um, as they are in the rest of the world. Um, I understand that it's only when the families say that it's okay for the information to be released. Um, now, I was just wondering if that's definitely not the case here because that's going to skew statistics and that could be uh, lead to a lack of trust. So I'd love to know just that definitely here in Northern Ireland if there is a death related to the COVID that it is released and that it's not withheld. And then um, finally, um, I, I, I did ask the Deputy First Minister, I did ask yourself, so I'm going to go for a third time, if there is service reconfiguration, can we please have an assurance that it's temporary and that after we get through this, which we will, that we'll be able to return the health service back to its former format. Thank you. Um, start off, PPP, uh, I think I've covered that a number of times, Paul. I should welcome you to the Health Committee for your first meeting. I, Looking forward to your support. In regards to to, to the testing, uh, being able to test people, see they're positive, and then tell them to self-isolate. 
we went a step further. We told anybody who was showing signs of a sin, symptom or symptom of COVID-19 to self-isolate. And that was without having to go through the process of getting a test. So that's, that's how we reacted and that's how, how we did that piece. So for the seven days, the seven days and the 14 days, um, isolation was there to, to take the pressure off. So we, we took an additional step there. In, in regards to deaths being released and those numbers being released, um, there is no way in Northern Ireland for a family to, to not have it recognised on a death certificate. And that's where we, we work off, that's where we gather, gather our certificate. Where we have um, is not identified in the past as something that may identify a patient to the community where the family didn't want them to do. As the number of deaths was always recorded and displayed, but we didn't go down the line of saying who or where they were because out of the respect to the family, um, we respected those wishes. Uh, thank you, uh, all of our listen, are very welcome to the uh, committee. Um, appreciate this is a very difficult time for the committee, as it is for, for all of us. Uh, just to reassure you that there is a statutory uh, a legal obligation to report death. So as Minister said, it is not something which there is within which there is discretion. Um, I think that it's important also to point out that the deaths that we will see in different parts of Europe, uh, different parts of the United Kingdom, different parts of the Republic of Ireland will be a function of a number of things. Where we have a higher percentage of older people, uh, or we have a higher percentage of people with underlying health conditions, then it is likely we will see greater numbers of deaths. I think that is some of the information and data that we're seeing coming from Italy, where the Northern Italy in particular, where they have large numbers of older people, many with long, uh, long term and their uh, conditions. Um, it's also important to say that in Northern Ireland, we probably also uh, have statistically a higher portion of older people than other parts of the UK. But let me just say this, that most people, irrespective of age, will make a full recovery from this. And I think that's important in the middle of all of this and all of the concern and public anxiety, which is understandable, that as the chair mentioned at the outset, that for most people, this will be a mild to moderate illness, irrespective of age, and the vast majority of people will make a full, uh, a full recovery. In terms of the reference to Germany, how a virus behaves when it enters a certain different uh, population in a different country depends on the population that it initially infects. Some of the emerging data from uh, Germany suggests it was perhaps a younger cohort of the population which may have been infected in the first instance. And we just need to really see how the virus becomes established in Germany as to how that manifests in the, in the weeks ahead. But just to say that we have taken an ultra-precautionary approach even before testing, we have said anyone who has symptoms, recognising many people who are self-isolating at the moment, and many households that are isolating will not have COVID-19. So we've taken an ultra-cautious approach that says, if you have any symptoms, such as a new continuous cough or fever, stay at home. And we've now combined that over recent weeks. Ministers here uh, have agreed at the COVID calls to uh, increase the social distancing, uh, to include closing bars and restaurants, uh, and it's good to see we now have a common uh, approach to that across these these islands. Um, and as I say, in the coming weeks, hopefully we'll begin to see the impact on that, not initially in the numbers of deaths, because don't forget that it'll take two to three weeks for those measures around social distancing to begin to have an impact. Sadly and tragically, the people who have died in recent days acquired their virus some many weeks ago. So we need to keep and hold our confidence that the social distancing measures that the Deputy Chair said at the outset are so vitally important because that will allow us to protect ourselves, protect each other and ultimately protect our health services so that those that need to access to care can get the quality of care that they need when they need it. 
third time I've asked that question and not had a response. I'll follow that up later. Right, no, I'll give you an answer. Good. Um, I don't know what the health service will look like in a week's time. I'll be perfectly blunt with you that. I don't know where we'll be. Our surge plans are in place to do what we have to do. That's why we're down to a number of procedures on the leg of surgeries that I would never have envisaged in my time that as a health minister, I would have to tell people they would not get. So to give any sort of commitment now that we will return 100% to where we were two months ago, I can't give it. And I won't give it because I can't stand over it. Minister, thank you. Thank you. Minister, I'm not going to take any more your time. I th really appreciate both your time. Well, Minister. I know you, you have still two members there. Look, if you just want to push another 10 or 15 minutes. I was, Minister, I was going to suggest, rather than uh, the members would probably have, I know Paula certainly has many questions, and I, I would suggest if you've committed to come back next week, that, that we would uh, prioritise those members first to come in first. Well, questions, if I get 10 minutes, look, I'm, I'm prepared to take Paula's priority questions or Alan's priority questions here now. So. Okay, Alan has one. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I welcome the, uh, the realistic remarks from the Chief Medical Officer there about the testing not being a magic uh, bullet. And I know there's uh, a lot of social media uh, medical experts are calling for more testing uh, and, in fact, uh, enhanced uh, contact tracing. Uh, can you tell me, is... Uh, I realise the value of contact uh, testing at the start of this outbreak when people were coming from overseas and carrying the, the virus back in, but does there, uh, at this stage, uh, does there continue to be any value in contact uh, tracing? Uh, well, just to say, we have, we have moved beyond the containment phase. This is, uh, and the, it was right to do that by a global pandemic. This virus is in every country in the world uh, and it will be reintroduced again because of the movement that we have between countries. Our opportunity to contain this uh, virus in China passed a considerable time ago. We were successful uh, in containing the virus in, the, uh, in these islands in the, in the United Kingdom and in the Republic of Ireland for a period. But we once we moved into uh, the place of sustained community transmission, then efforts to contain the spread of the virus were passed. We are now in the stage of trying to delay and minimize the impact on our health service. If we can pull down this peak again, reduce the rate of transmission, what we may then be able to do as testing capacity increases is, is move into another phase of trying to contain the virus through increased testing and contact tracing, but it isn't at this juncture. Our focus now must be in managing those people and providing the best care for those uh, who have been infected and at the same time, continuing to press down on the peak by following the advice on self-isolation, household isolation and social distancing. As we get to a later phase, yes, um, there are other things which we will need to think about doing, including some of the things that we were doing in the earlier phase. We may need to think about also uh, relaxing some of the social distancing measures for a period. That might be possible. But the risk is, as we tend to relax those, there may be a re-emergence of the virus and we may need to introduce. But we need to bear in mind that we cannot maintain these uh, social distancing measures indefinitely. So again, there's modeling going on to examine what the impact of that might be. But our priority at the moment is to get that R value down to stop the virus transmitting as rapidly and as widely as it is at present. And that's why returning to the comments at the outset about the importance of social distancing and regular hand washing. First, Dr. McBride. Thank you, so, uh, th thank you for that. Can I just ask one final quick question, and that's about those who may be asymptomatic. And, you know, obviously the advice given is to take as much caution as possible. Will that capture those individuals who may not actually show any symptoms or have any effect from the virus that they may be carrying? I'll have the Chief Medical Officer on. 
Uh, we, we have no evidence, and it would be contrary to other coronaviruses, that asymptomatic carriage of the virus will drive the pandemic. We know uh, from this virus and indeed other coronaviruses that people are most infectious at the time of onset of symptoms and hence the importance of good respiratory hygiene and a good hand hygiene. And hence the very important messages around self-isolation and the precautionary approach to household isolation as well to ensure that we limit spread. Uh, so the, I suppose the simple answer is there's no evidence that individuals who carry this asymptomatically are going to be major drivers of spread of the infection. But it's a very important question because it may well be that many, many people, many more than we realize, have actually already been exposed to this virus and may have developed immunity. And that's why the question that was asked earlier by members around antibody tests are so crucially important. Because that means we can reassure uh, large numbers of our front kind of health, frontline healthcare workers, other, other public sector workers, that they can go back and safely provide treatment, care, and support and services. And actually, what it may also tell us is that the more true mortality from this virus is less than we currently think, because it may well be there are many, many more people infected that are actually presenting uh, or self isolating at home contacting their general practitioner, getting admitted to hospital, or, uh, or sadly, in some cases, uh, dying from, from the virus itself. Thank you very much. Um, I, think that's, I think we'll let you go to your executive meeting, Minister, and just, re <laughs> just restate that uh, we do very much appreciate um, your being here remotely today and look forward to speaking to you next week and uh, wish you all the best for the week ahead. Thank you, Chair. And just again, can I thank the members of the committee for the support they are given, because, um, as I've said before, don't underestimate um, when you thank the health service for what they do, just how much that means to our frontline workers. Should it be a cleaner, should it be a porter, a nurse, a surgeon, a community pharmacist, a GP? Um, every word of support that comes out from, from the committee, from the MLAs, from individuals, means so much at this minute in time, Chair. So thank you very much for your support. Members, we're just going to take um, a quick break so we can set up the next Skype session and a quick comfort break. So we'll be, be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members. Thank you. Um, I have admitted to refer the members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 23rd of March, which are tab 3.2 of the meeting pack. Are members content with those minutes? Great. Great. Thank you. And we're just, um, while we're waiting to get our Skype connection going with the GPs, we're going to go to um, the next uh, piece of legislation. The members, we uh, now turn to three items of subordinate legislation connected to the COVID-19 crisis, two of which are tabled since the pack issued and uh, we're being asked to consider and approve today without the normal time to consider. I would remind members that even if the committee's approval is given, this is without prejudice to the committee's ongoing scrutiny role, so it would be open to the committee to return to these matters in due course and advise the department of any issues we identify or recommend that they be amended or revoked. So um, that's item seven, the SL1, the mental capacity, deprivation of liberty, amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. And I refer you members to tab 7.1 of your pack. The Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to make modifications to the principal mental capacity deprivation of liberty regulations on a temporary basis in the case of widespread unavailability of the health and social care workforce due to pandemic emergency. Such modifications include requirements around training, experience, the makeup of trust panels, the authorisation of detentions and the definition of a responsible medical practitioner. The regulations will modify who can do certain duties but imposes a reporting requirement when the modifications are used. The department advises that there are no specific operational date for commencement of the regulations as they may need to be brought into force without prior warning and in breach of the 21-day rule. When they come into operation, they will remain in force 
only so long as Schedule 10 of the Coronavirus Bill is in operation. The Department further advises that the key stakeholders have been consulted and are content. So are members content that the Department makes the statutory rule? Agreed. Members agreed. Thank you. Uh, new item SL1, the Establishment and Agencies, Fitness of Workers Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and I refer members to tab 12 in the table papers. The Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to make temporary changes to re-employment vetting policy for health and social care roles. This will enable employers to start a worker in advance of full re-employment vetting, but subject to certain conditions, including supervision. This is to ensure that the pre-employment vetting does not cause undue delay in recruiting staff urgently to health and social care roles to cover for significant COVID-19 related staff absences and additional workload. The Department advises that proof of identification and registration with regulatory bodies where applicable would still be required and that individuals would be supervised until all specified pre-employment information is received. The Department also advises that there is no specific operational date for commencement of the regulations, but is likely to be imminent. The regulations may need to be brought into force without prior warning and in breach of the 21-day rule. Members will recall that a relaxation of vetting requirements was one of the issues raised with us last week by representatives of the care sector. Our members content that the Department makes a statutory rule. Chair. Comment from Orlea. Okay. Mm-hmm. Comment from Orlea, yes. Orlea had um, submitted by email some comments in relation to the SL1s on establishment and agencies um, and the following one, commenting on the lack of information in terms of the detail, um, also the lack of information as to the, any equivalent provisions in the South. Um, she comments that obviously we're, this is not the normal process um, and understands that these uh, this is for good reason, given the crisis um, and the need to support the health service at this time. But in, she, she is suggesting that the committee might encourage provision of a um, sunset clause in respect of these. Um, now, some of them we, we can explore with the department um, if that's feasible. Some of them we've been advised are hooked already to commencement and operation of the coronavirus bill, mm-hmm. um, the previous one, I think, yeah, was well, that was the case. Um, this one would require a further uh, statutory rule to revoke, is what the department is planning, as I understand it. But we could go back and, if the committee was content with that proposal, um, you could still approve that the, the SR is made, but you could also write to the department and convey the committee's wish that a sunset clause be considered. That it's a definite date on it, whereas the, the department wishes to keep it open so that they can revoke it when it's no longer necessary when the pandemic passes, um, rather than putting a specific date on it at this time. Okay. Any members got a comment, or or are you? I'm content the way it is. But, you know. Sorry, just to clarify, or less saying there should be some sort of clause on the committee's perspective. That when the when at the moment this is an SL one, so this is a proposal for a rule and she's suggesting that when the rule is, is um, drafted it should be drafted with an automatic um, date on which the rule would no longer apply the department had indicated that they will bring a separate they're not inclined to do that that their proposal at the moment is that they would revoke it when the pandemic passes rather than automatically for this particular rule could, could we correct this really um put a clause to say review it at a certain stage as part of the sunset clause, rather than it expires, so say for dog's sake, four or five months we can review it. Um, so we're going to say whether it's relevant or not. Is that possible? But it is relevant because it can. It's only there as long as this contagion is there. So it's why? Two why years. Yeah, but if it's two years, it's two years. Yeah, it's six months, over. it's six months. But as soon as it's over, it goes. So why are we so hung up on that, if you know what I mean? Yes. Not you personally, no, but... You know. fair. I just think, I think the whole thing, there's, there's, there's argument for a, um, a review of, of the whole legislation in, in a few months' time, generally, is my view, but I would be generally supportive of the idea. I just think maybe easier to review it in a few, in a few months, because it might still be relevant in three months' time. It might not. So, I mean, I, I don't have a concrete proposal as such, but that's my, my general view on it. 
I don't think yeah. I don't think anybody is saying that they're not content that the department makes the statutory rule today. I think it, there just may be a question to go back to see if there is another way of um, looking at it other than, than the way the department is proposing to look at it in terms of sanding it down again so in time. So we could put the question. You could put the question then on the rule, and then we we'll put the question on a letter to go from the committee to suggest consideration of building in a review into the statutory rule. Would members be happy enough with that? I will be supporting that. You won't be supporting it? Okay. Um, I think we have to be careful that we don't add the bureaucratic yeah. demands of our civil servants at this difficult time. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So um, it's, it simply is at this point then, are members content that the department makes the statutory rule? That, that is the question that needs to answer at this point. Agreed. Agreed? Yeah, I would agree. Agreed. And and yes, and we would look then to review that going forward. Members are content. Are members content or? Generally, yeah. Mm -hmm. Alex? I don't want to agree with it because it will be ended. Okay. So we'll Do we want to put that to some uh, a vote then of your proposal that we? I don't need to review it, so I propose okay. we don't need to. Is it not? Uh, is it not an absolute that it will be reviewed? I mean, that's absolutely what it is. You know. I would imagine. Um, so. I mean, Chair, it, just, doesn't just for, me. for, it doesn't worry me. It doesn't worry me. I propose that we add it to our future work program and in. Three to four months' time, we look at it again. Is that a, a, a fair proposal if we need to? If, if it's if it's fall, sorry, if it's fell, it's fell. If, if it's still in place and people uh, disagree that it should be in place, then we can have a vote if necessary or debate. Is that fair enough? And you're putting that as a proposal, Jerry? I want to, yeah. If you second it, I'm that. happy enough with the, the committee revisit it and we can have a discussion about it in six months or whatever, but I don't think we need to incorporate it into the, the wording of it. Okay, so are we happy to continue now that the department will, will go ahead? We've already said that we're content that the department makes a statutory rule. Uh, in terms of the review then, do you want it just to be included in the work programme that we look at it again? Yeah. That's the agreement then, the committee? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So new item SR 2020-46, the Mental Health Northern Ireland Amendment Order 2020. I refer members to tab 13 in table papers. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Department has laid a statutory rule to relax the requirements to review the medication of detained patients after set periods. This is to ensure that patients can continue to receive their medication should there be staff absences due to the virus. The Department advises that it has consulted professional bodies, the Trusts and the Attorney General and that there is broad support for the measure. The SR is subject to negative resolution and has not yet been considered by the examiner of statutory rules. It is proposed that the SR would come into operation on the 30th of March and the department has committed to revoking the SR once the pandemic passes. The department did initially submit an SL1 policy proposal for the statutory rule for consideration at today's meeting but in view of the crisis went ahead and laid the statutory rule yesterday so the SL1 is included in the pack for information. Members, any um, issues that they wish to raise? Just, I mean, obviously things need to be passed, but some of the language in it is very worrying. I mean, if you take Regulation 2 as an example, it says that the modifications provide that a person does not need to have training, experience working with people who lack capacity and do not have to be appointed a suitably qualified person to act as a suitably qualified person. And I know there's probably very practical reasons for that, and in ordinary times we might get some more breakdown and information on that, but some of the language in there is it's saying a suitably qualified person doesn't have to have experience, doesn't have to have qualifications, but can take significant decisions. Um, or is it the other way about than that? Is it saying that a reverse of that? As far as I understand it, this is to allow continuity of care, so that someone's medications wouldn't be changed, that they would continue as they are. Mm -hmm. uh, in ordinary circumstances, there is a requirement for medications to be reviewed. Periodically, I think it's every three months, because mm -hmm. I understand this would delay that so that the medication review would only be required every six months. They're worried that if they don't have adequate numbers of staff, yeah. 
people simply wouldn't be legally allowed to receive, continue receiving the medications they currently are on and are very important to those people's well-being. So this is as far as under, it's not, this regulation is designed to allow continuity rather than change or decision making. Okay. Okay. Can't have enough call. Okay. So uh, may I put the question formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 46, the Mental Health Northern Ireland Amendment Order 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Is that agreed? Agreed? Yep. Thank you. And I'll go on to the correspondence. Um, refer members to correspondence at tab 8 of the pack and to the table papers and to the correspondence memo at 8.1. May I draw the, the member's attention to item 8.6. The Committee for Finance has asked that all statutory committees participate in standardised process for scrutiny of the executive budget as the compressed timetable for the budget process may not follow adequate time for committee scrutiny. To this end, RIAs have produced a template to be completed by all departments at the request of the committees. Are members content that the committees issue the template to the department and ask for a response in time for the departmental briefing on the budget scheduled for the 23rd of April? Okay, thank you. And our members also agree that the completed templates be forwarded to the Committee of Finance and raised once received by the Committee OS. Okay. Um, so we have a proposed timeline at the 23rd of April meeting um, to agree committee position and forward to the Department's raise and Committee for Finance during the week commencing 27th of April. Members content... Uh, with the proposed actions as noted in the correspondence panel and to note the items in the table papers. Thank you. And item nine, the forward work programme. Uh, may I refer members to the draft forward work programme at tab 9.1 of the pack, which has been paired back given the current circumstances. Um, are members content to uh, note the forward work programme? And I know, members, we have had um, a little bit of discussion around um, future meetings, and we know that the Committee on Procedures is considering modifications to working practices to facilitate safe ongoing work in the circumstances. But uh, for now, are you content to note the Forward Work Programme? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any other business? Alex? Um, I'm not sure what to do on this. Um, Westminster yesterday continued with uh, the Northern Ireland Abortion Act, isn't it? Um, and with regulations, and some of them are quite awful, up to 24 weeks. Um, and it's very worrying that, with us having devolution up and running, that they've just gone ahead and done this. I, I was wondering. Uh, there's, I, I don't know what other members, but I certainly had 230 emails from yesterday about it, um, and I don't exactly know what, what they're proposing totally, but is there any way we can get some sort of briefing on it, um, and guidance, if there's anything we can do as an assembly on any areas that we maybe don't agree with, for what we can do. Um, it's obviously very worrying, and I certainly don't agree with some of the the measures that they're proposing in these regulations. I think the sure, I think the situation. I've had the emails as well, and it's, it's it's really it comes up your whole system at the moment too. You know that you're you're missing important emails because they're buried in among all these emails that are coming in, um, and they're asking us uh, really to uh, to set aside the legislation and uh, to bring out uh, you know to have a Northern Ireland debate about it and and, and stuff. And that's really, that's outside our sort of control at the moment. The reality is that if yesterday was the start date of that legislation, then it's law. Uh, I don't know what the procedures are for changing it, whether, and it's very difficult because at the moment the Speaker is, is you, I mean, he's placed restrictions on, you know, private members' bills and, and, and all sorts of things. So I, I, I can't see how... I don't want to give people false hope. I want to reply to all these people, but you want to yeah. tell them that there's things you can do and you can't do. But I'm not sure how we can, how it could come back into 
the assembly during this current phase where we're going to be cutting down the plenary sessions and just our ability to bring things forward are going to be quite quite limited. But certainly if we could get maybe some expert advice from somebody just to, uh, but... Yeah, and I know, yeah. Col I know Colin's looking in here, but um, the clerk's advised me, yeah, that's true, the, uh, the committee were planning to get a briefing on, on this topic, um, but then COVID-19 obviously was prioritised as... Um, I think all committees have prioritised this crisis um, in terms of committee actions. So, I and mean, I don't know whether I don't know what the point. I mean, I have very, very um, serious concerns around the legislation that is being imposed on us, um, and I don't know um, how, as a committee, we take that forward. Given the crisis that we're in, it would members be content that we add it to? Um, forward work programme, or maybe that maybe this, given the, the announcement yesterday, maybe this committee should be asking for the department for guidance as to where we go from here as uh, as an assembly, and whether the, the assembly has um, a role in or asking what role the assembly has in making any changes that the assembly democratically wishes to take. Colin, you run on again. Yeah, so just echoing what you say at the end there, I think maybe what might be important in the first line yeah. is to completely separate the two issues. If you take the issue of abortion and what members think it should be, shouldn't be, what the impact should be and shouldn't be, and then take the other line and saying, what can this assembly actually do? Um, because I think a lot of the, there, there's a sense that the announcement was made yesterday, and a lot. I mean, I have 230 odd emails in as well. Mm -hmm. But there's a sense of just you have a private members bill and get it changed. But that's I don't right. think that's actually the way that it happens. And I don't even know myself. I'm not experienced enough to know exactly what the process is here. But you know, I, I would be very surprised if legislation can be passed in Westminster and then just suddenly we can overturn it here. Mm -hmm. Again, notwithstanding the issue, but I'm saying. That you know, I just think the process is that can, can that actually be done? Because you could do it, and then in a month's time, Westminster could just overturn our decision, and then we could be. It's to get the actual nuts and bolts of, of what can happen, because then we can temper people's expectations, and they well, like the last time, last October when this happened, there is very, very, very strong sense of feeling and people target you as an MLA but you're actually powerless to be able to do anything so I think being able to send a very clear message that says we're not able to change it so don't shoot the messenger you know the decision has been taken elsewhere but it would be good to find the nuts and bolts and what we can or not do yeah. um, is that Jerry? possible? Yeah, well, I'll get Chair's comments and then we'll come back. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I mean, uh, something that I proposed the NIO come in, it was kind of before the coronavirus yeah. sort of exploded from other, or you know, as prominent as it was. I mean, I would generally still like that if possible, but understand there's, there's a lot of restrictions on pain. Um, and I, to, to be frank, I mean, regard, whatever people's views on it, I mean, this is going to still be a healthcare issue throughout this, this um, coronavirus crisis for the next two or three months, and it is uh, a healthcare issue. That's, that's why, obviously, we. we Talk about it. So I, I would be keen, if possible, to try and get a briefing uh, on this, so I can ask sort of questions. And I've glanced through the guidelines. I have some concerns that it still places restriction on, on women. To be frank, uh, so I would like to tease them out and, and ask questions about that. I think um. sure too. The, you know, you, you've heard the minister there, and it's very heart heartfelt about uh, elective surgery and all. It's been put on hold, and the waiting lists are going to get. Bigger and, and and so on. There's just there's nothing you can do about it because we are dealing with this pandemic. Um, so I'm just wondering that even though the that legislation came into place yesterday, does the health service at the moment have the capacity to actually to comply with you know what's required of it? Uh, I think that's a question that maybe w w we need an answer to, but. I would appreciate if this committee could very quickly maybe have a conversation with, I don't know whether it's the business office or, or some of the experts down the corridor that, that deal with these things, uh, and, and maybe turn around in 24 hours, come back to us and say, look, there, there, there's the only, there's, there's the, there are no options, no, or there, there's an option, there's an option, there's an option, and at least give us something to come back. I'm, I'm not going to plan to anybody 
in the meantime, but I will have to reply to him as we will have to acknowledge it at least. But it would be nice if we could have that definitive answer. As Colm says, I'm yeah. sorry, but this is there's nothing we can do, and that and that's yeah. That's it, you oh, know. So I if we could, maybe if, if, if that information, the clerk could get that information for yeah. us, if it well, wouldn't be too onerous to and, and to share it with us, maybe quickly, yeah. so we can formulate our reply. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that we'll, we'll ask the clerk to um, to explore the options and get information because we probably could uh, request a written briefing from. The NIO on the topic and maybe start with that yeah. as a starting point. But I mean, it's certainly to, to many of our constituents, this is seen as a very, very urgent issue as well. And we, we do need clarity on where we are as assembly and what powers we have to change or not change what has been put in place. So I think that would be appropriate that we that we ask the clerk basically yeah. to to go away and explore the options to get that, the information that we need or bring it back to this committee. Yep. Yeah. I think for for now, members, that's all we can do. Clark, have you any comment you want to make on that? That's fine. Um, that's fine. Okay. All right. Um, so, any um, is there any other business at this point? I presume we're still having difficulties. With the connection, the, Dr. Dorman's uh, technology wasn't working properly, so we're hoping to connect with Dr. Stout now from the AMA. Okay. <coughs> Okay. Okay, so we are uh, moving on to item five, which is our COVID-19 <coughs> disease response briefing from uh, British Medical Association GP Committee and the Royal College of GPs, MI. Uh, I'm advised members that the BMA GP Committee and the RCGP NI have agreed to brief us on COVID-19 situation in general practice. Given we are limited to one Skype connection at a time, we will hear from each organisation in turn. And um, we've obviously had some difficulties with the technology. And um, so we will be going to Dr uh, Stout. Uh, Dr. Alan Stout, Chairperson of BMA NI GP Committee, and you're very welcome, Dr. Stout. Thank you for being with us. I understand technology doesn't always work as we would like it, but you're very welcome to um, today's Health Committee, and we appreciate the chance to be able to hear what you have to say and then to ask you some questions. So if you would like to go ahead and brief the committee at this time. Yeah, okay. I'm having me this You can hear me okay? Little bit loud, so. I'll turn. Is that any better? Uh, it's still quite loud, but. We'll, okay. We, we can hear you, so go ahead. Okay. As I say, thank you for having me today. There's no question in extra times, and that uh, extra to, to all of us. I have to say a bit of misunderstanding just how quick. Uh, and approved care has. Dr. Stout, can I interrupt you? Sorry, it, it, it's very, very poor quality. Uh, we're missing most of what you're saying. Uh, let me see if I can. Um, is that any better? It may be better. We'll, we'll keep trying. I think they're still working at this end as well to see if we can improve the quality. So. Carry on, I'll interrupt if, if we still can't make you out. Okay, well, I'll, I'll brief in my introduction and I'm making questions which will be easier to deal with. Uh, saying that I'm founded and actually impressed by just the primary candidates responded. Sorry, Dr. We, we, we cannot hear you, we can't make you out, and we're, we're being told that the problem is at your end of things, so I don't know if you want to. Try something more, or if somebody can help you out there. Yeah. 
to her maybe earphones uh, and we told her are quite good to stop the feedback so I don't know if the doctor has any earphones if he wants to try that. Yeah, Dr Stout you don't have a pair of earphones? Uh, As we speak. Excellent. <laughs> Prepared. Thank you for that, Chair. Uh, I've been told I wasn't guaranteed that it does work. <laughs> we suggested them. We will see. Okay, we now have no signed, Dr. Stout. You might need to unmute your speaker. I've made a couple of we, there now. So we, we, have, you we can hear you again. Let's see if talk away and see if we can make you out. Okay. Does it make any difference with the changes of have made? I think it's very slightly better. So have a go and we'll see if, it, if this works. Okay. Um, so I was just saying that in general practice, I've been astounded and amazed at just how quickly the practices have reacted to the problems that we're facing. And one of the critical things is that this isn't solely about related problems. We have to practices are still in a position to react to a medical need, which is still going to be there and still going to be presenting during the pandemic. So until we get to the absolute critical phases of the pandemic, we're still going to have patients present with heart disease, strokes, and with various other problems and lumps and bumps and other medical diseases. So we have to be able to protect practice to be able to do that. Met mental health, and I think the minister referred to this earlier, a concern of ours is going to be an increase in with time. So critical plans are to keep practices safe and clean to prevent cross-contamination, but also to be in addition to, to these ongoing issues. And that has led to the development of COVID centres, which are primary and primary care staff, and provide input for patients that practices are worried about, uh, either because they've got COVID-19 confirmed, suspected, and are clinically worsening, or that there's a diagnostic certainty around the COVID-19, which they need to other problems that might be those condition it will be things like a mild something like a tonsillitis more significant cases and meningitis one of the things we don't have to do is miss really serious diagnoses, diagnoses assumption that ever related to COVID-19 so we have to be in that we're able to assess those patients and offer the appropriate treatment and treatment so critical centres as well, is that by setting this up... Dr Stout, putting... apologies for interrupting you. We, we were desperately trying to make out and it, it's just not working. I feel like we're missing so much um, that you're trying to convey to us uh, and I, I don't think we've got any other choice other than to abandon this session for now because it, we, we simply can't hear you. Um, uh -huh. and, and I'm aware even if we were to ask you questions, we wouldn't be able to hear your responses. So I, I think we're going to have to um, reschedule and try and um, do this at another date and time. And we, I just want to say that we do fully appreciate as a committee the uh, incredible work that the GP workforce are, are um, embroiled in at this time, this critical time. And just to pass on our best wishes to 
to the GPs and to their, their staff at this time and uh, let you know that we do support your, all your efforts in de dealing with this COVID-19 crisis. So thank you and um, we will speak to you uh, hopefully in the very near future with a better connection so that we can, we can hear your full brief and ask questions fully. So thank you and we will talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, that we will um, come back to um, the briefing at another time. Um, so the only thing I think we've left to deal with was the next meeting. We might be able to get Dr. Dorman on oh. Skype now, so if you want to suspend. Okay, we'll, we'll suspend briefly here to see if we can get Dr. Dorman on Skype now. No, 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 no. Okay, we're back on again. We're, we're hopeful that we will be able to hear from Dr. Lawrence Dorman here, Chairperson of the Royal Co College of GPs for Northern Ireland. Dr. Uh, Dorman, you can hear us okay? I can indeed, yes. And the good news is that we can hear you, so uh, we're very happy with that. And uh, you're very welcome to um, committee today. And I'm going to invite you to go ahead and brief the committee and then we'll ask you some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, colleagues. Thank you for allowing me to give evidence to the Health Committee at this time of national emergency. The Royal College of GPs is the membership body for 53,000 GPs in the UK, and it was established to encourage, foster and maintain the high, highest possible standards in general practice. So I am the chair of the Royal College of GPs in Northern Ireland, and I am a practicing GP in Kilkeel. My experience as a working GP and the experience of my colleagues is that the COVID-19 virus is here in our communities already. We are managing our patients with as much care and skill as we can in the community, but due to the infectious nature and risk to our staff and families, we have had to do this remotely where possible. I've, I've been humbled to see the work performed at speed, not only by our GPs and practices, but throughout government and in our dealings through the Department of Health, the Health and Social Care Board, Public Health and our trusts. And in many ways, this crisis is showing us at our best. We are doing work that previously would have taken years as being done in weeks. I do, however, wish to share with the committee three main concerns that our GP members have at this current time. The first one is about testing, and I understand, I mean, our Chief Medical Officer has mentioned this already. The Royal College of GPs would like to see priority and expedited COVID-19 testing for GP staff, team members and their families. This is essential to ensuring that we can keep staff active and working on the front line as the situation develops. GP practices will find it increasingly difficult to deliver any service, both in their practice and to COVID centres, if our GPs are forced to self-isolate. Our members are frequently informing us of cases where a child in a household develops a temperature, thus grounding an asymptomatic and well GP for 14 days. Frequently, GPs are married to other doctors, and this is a double whammy to our workforce, which we cannot sustain. We applaud the incredible work our laboratory staff have done over the past few weeks. We are truly in their debt and we sincerely appreciate their work. We encourage anyone with influence to ensure GPs have access to testing. Similar to our trust colleagues, and there cannot be an inequity of this, to ensure our workforce is at its maximal capacity to face the challenge ahead. We ensure that our trust colleagues view us as valued integral path of, of this staff and that we have access to testing together and that there are clear guidelines to how our GP colleagues can access this testing. So our next point is about the COVID centres. Uh, and as we can hear in the news this morning, as GPs, we are frightened. I am frightened too. I am a father, I am a husband. And I would not ask my GP colleagues to do something that I would not be prepared to do myself. Today we have issued with our GP colleagues, and I pay huge credit to Dr. Alan Stout, a joint letter which tries to allay some of the fears of our colleagues. But these COVID centres are essential. They will be physically located in trust premises or out of ours premises, which are less utilised. And this is to allow us to use our Adastra computer software, 
which will help facilitate the communication between the practice and the centre. They will be able to use disinfecting procedures at scale, which has not been possible to perform in our surgeries, and will also act as a central source for, for PPE protection equipment, and this will ensure that it is used most appropriately and not wasted. A culture of collaboration between those working in the centre and their hospital colleagues is vital. Together we must stand united in the face of the pandemic and general practice is rising to this challenge like never before. It necessitates us to work in a very different way and we're committed to making it work. Should we struggle to staff these centres through GP shortages or excessive patient numbers, we urge trusts to support us by allocating us frontline staff. They will work alongside us as equal colleagues, and this is the core of how we as a society and one health and social care will collective effort will succeed. As a profession, we value all our GPs, our sessional GPs, salaried, and we welcome those who are returning to, to join us in this most difficult of challenges. And the third point, as we mentioned before, was about personal protection equipment. It is essential that healthcare professionals working on the front line in the battle against COVID-19 have access to the most appropriate personal protection equipment. Currently, GPs in Northern Ireland have some access to personal protection equipment, but they're running out quickly. And we welcome the health minister's update to the assembly on the 24th of March, which announced that he was releasing 30% more of the pandemic stockpile. Today, our own chair, Dr. Martin Marshall, has written to the UK Health Secretary, Martin Han Matt Hancock, asking for urgent clarification on the government about how the clearer guidelines about whether to wear protective equipment for all patients who could be suspicious of a virus, but have no symptoms and still potentially infect staff. He also noted that the World Health Organization recommends family doctors have eye protection, but to date, um, there hasn't been any here yet, and about the use of the aprons that doctor have been given rather than full body cover. So this is, the, the, the essence of my evidence to the inquiry, I am very grateful and I'm very happy to take uh, questions. As Alan alluded to earlier, the, the business of general practice continues. We have patients that need our care, that need our compassion, but we need to be protected to do it. We believe these centres will help both GPs and our hospital colleagues, but they must be viewed as a collaborative piece of work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dorman. Um, I really appreciate that um, briefing that you've given and um, absolutely appreciate the passion with which you delivered that brief and um, want to re reiterate certainly my support to you as a professional and applaud your selflessness in going forward in order to combat this terrible disease. Um, I think it's incredible what the GPs are, are doing and the setting up of these COVID centres is, is obviously very vital in, in order to help um, not just the hospitals but um, GP practices themselves and indeed pharmacy and I think it's, uh, it's a, a, a vital initiative and I very much welcome the, the COVID-19 uh, centres. In terms of staffing of the COVID centres, what, um, what staffing uh, are GPs having to do? Are, are they to be staffed by the trust or are the GPs to use some of their own staff? And if so, um, how would staff be selected? You know, and are would that be for what type of um, duties would it be administrative or only for essential medical professions to take part in that? So, so our trust staff have been very helpful, and they have supplied us with accommodation and administration staff, and helped supply the necessary computer equipment and software. They will also help provide drivers so we can perform house visits to patients, and we're very grateful to all that. What we would say is that, is at the moment is that GPs are going to be staffing these themselves. So there will be a mandatory, depending on your practice list size, 
uh, and those GPs will come through the practice. We also will be welcoming our sessional doctors to be involved in this, and this is vital because we intend that this will give us some out of hours cover, and particularly in evenings and at weekends. That's very good. And um, in terms of funding for additional practice contributions, where, where will they come from if needed? So, so the Health and Social Care Board have been very supportive. Uh, one of the ways that we will be doing this is through our GMS contract, which will be during the working hours of the day until 6 o'clock. At the moment, the Health and Social Care Board have been very supportive and they have allowed us to, to drop most of our non-essential work. And so we've been able to redirect our resources. We've, we've basically tuned our practices down to the bare minimum. And this has facilitated us, so we hope that this will release our frontline staff to be able to do these centres. By doing this, we protect our practices. We don't want any risk to our reception staff. We don't want any risk of any of this virus coming home in our clothes. And by setting up designated centres, where we can do this will be much safer, both for our patients, our GPs, and our practice staff. Okay. And uh, in terms of ventilators, do, do any GP practices um, have ventilators? And is there a plan or do you have any ventilators at any of these COVID-19 centres or, or is that reserved for hospital admissions? So ventilators are referring to the FFP3 masks. So these masks have, have been designed or are, are recommended for aerosol generating procedures. And those sort of procedures uh, would be things like nebulizers or, or close use of oxygen. So while we have been assessed for fitting, we feel in general practice they would not be the most uh, appropriate and they would be better used in the centres. But the centres gives us a, a source that we could use them should we, should we require this. So basically in case of an emergency emergency that, that you would use this type of equipment but preferably not? Yes, I mean, our general feeling on the ground is that if we have to uh, perform interventionalist uh, procedures such as nebulisation, such as putting an airway in the general practice, really that patient needs to be going to hospital. And the purpose of these centres is for assessment rather than treatment. Okay, that's great. Um, members, questions? Jerry? Yep. Um... Just a question. Thanks for that presentation. Um, in terms of the COVID centres, um, um, have you got insurance assurances that the people working there, the staff working there, will have appropriate, uh, the correct, and enough uh, PPE equipment? Yes, we have been. We have received that assurance, and, and we believe that that will be right. Uh, it will be very diff difficult to supply adequate PPE to 326 practices all across the country. By having it in this, at scale, it'll be much easier to do. Okay, and uh, we have some questions from Colm, our chair remotely, so the clerk is going to read those out. So a question on testing. Given the WHO position on testing, 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 can GPs advise the committee on their assessment on the current levels of testing, tracing, and isolating. So, I, I, GPs on the ground are not responsible for testing. Uh, our, our urge is for testing of staff. The, the testing of the population, we will have to leave to the chief medical officer and take his advice on it. But our priority at the moment is our staff. We are losing staff who are well because they are self-isolating at home, usually due to a family member having a temperature, and we urgently need GPs to be tested to get them back into the workforce. Okay. And uh, Colin? Yeah, maybe just, uh, could you, uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, could you maybe just expand on that? Because we've been told that testing really isn't uh, worthwhile insofar as, as soon as you're tested, you could catch uh, the virus afterwards so is there a value to testing and um, maybe just uh, as well in terms of the protective equipment from the gp practices and reaching out into the community services do you feel that there's enough ppe, PPE on the ground for 
uh, domiciliary care staff in the community that are visiting your patients and you know sometimes up to three or four times a day people coming in and out is there enough uh, protective equipment for what's happening on the ground so yes there, there is value in testing it is vitally important if, if i develop a cough or a temperature that i can go to my practice and not infect my colleagues in terms of the ppe that's a very valid point and, and it is affecting our practices and it is affecting how we work. For example, uh, we have patients who need palliative care treatment from cancers unrelated, to, unrelated to, to COVID. And if they start developing a temperature, how do our district nursing colleagues, our Marie Curie colleagues, safely go into their houses? So it is vital that we all have adequate PPE. And just on that, Dr. Dorman, what additional duties, responsibilities or powers will district nurses and community respiratory teams have as a result of the new centres? So the only way to refer into the centre is through the GP practice or through the out of hours. Uh, we value our district nursing colleagues very highly and we would be very keen to keep those lines of communication open with them so if they had a concern they could contact their GP practice that they work with and we would relay their concerns. Okay. Um, so Alan, yes, I know Colm has another question as well. The clerk's going to read, and then we'll go to Alan. Just it was also <coughs> relating to the kit. If um, Dr. Dorman could give an assessment of uh, the distribution of kit at the moment across grades and geography uh, and staff grades, sorry. So uh, I'm unable to answer for other areas and so on. Uh, our initial amount of kit that we received. Was, was small, which that reflected you know, the demand of the services and so on. But we had received assurances that if we request more kit, uh, that, that, that will be there for us. Okay, Alan. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, doctor, I just uh, would echo the remarks of the Chair of the admiration and gratitude that we have for the work being carried out by GPs and their staff at this particular time. But in terms of you talked there about uh, the testing, if you have a support member of your staff uh, who's not coming into work because someone in their household is maybe showing uh, symptoms. Um, is it, when you talk about testing, is it, is it the support worker that you want tested? Uh, because if they're tested and they, they're negative, they're going to have to go back to that environment to you know, live. So, you know, it, it, the, is it, is it, are you going to, do you want everybody in that household tested to show that that household is negative? Because to say the value of just testing your support worker and then bringing them into work, they, they could contract the, the disease the next day and bring it into work. So it is a bit of a dilemma, I feel. It, it is, and I, I think that's a very fair point. The, the person that we would like tested is what we call the index case which could be the child with the temperature rather than the actual healthcare worker. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Dorman, um, just to ask you another couple of questions. Um, what proportion of patients treated by uh, a COVID-19 centre will be dealt with remotely vis-a-vis uh, -vis those treated in the centre itself? And also, um, how do you envisage the, the new centre's impact what impact do you think they'll have on normal duties and pressures of paramedics? So again, those are good questions. The COVID centres themselves are, are not performing telephone triage. They are there as assessment centres. So the duty of triage and shifting through what needs assessment, what needs a face-to-face -face assessment, will still rely on the practice or our out of ours colleagues. You make a valid point about our paramedic colleagues and we are very aware of our paramedic colleagues and, and their risks that, that they face every day. And we, we urge as well that our paramedic colleagues have an adequate PPE protection as well. And while what we hope to do with these centres is that patients will provide their own transport. This gives us a couple of advantages in that it helps us allow them to wait in their cars while they're waiting for assessment, so reducing any potential risk of transmission in a, in a traditional waiting room sense. And should their care be required to be escalated, well then we will have to either hopefully get them the, to hospital by their own cars or else through our paramedic colleagues. Okay, and maybe you would just give us a, 
uh, if you can, a, a step by step process of what a patient would expect you know, will happen um, under the remit of their local COVID-19 centre if they, um, if they end up having to use that service. If you can give us a okay. step. So if a patient goes into a practice and gives one of the symptoms that are recognised at the moment, you know, a temperature over 37.8 or a new continuous cough, and they're exhibiting symptoms that show that they're starting to show respiratory distress or trouble in breathing, the GP that they have contacted will have concerns and will wish to have a direct face-to-face -face assessment. And so they will do a referral to the COVID centre through our, our what we call our CCG computer system, which is the same process that we use when we're uh, referring to hospital for advice or, or, or assessment. The COVID centre then will organise a time and appointment for that patient and the patient will go directly to the centre. They will be advised to wait in their car and then they will be called in, hopefully individually, for an initially a nurse or a healthcare assistant will take their basic observations. They will then be seen by a GP wearing the appropriate protective gear and they will be assessed. The doctor then will be, the GP then will be able to decide do they need their care increased, as in do they need to go to hospital? Do they need maybe some simple basic medication? such as inhalers or antibiotics and be allowed to return to their home to have most of their care delivered at home uh, or, or they can be turned around quite quickly. The other role that we see for these centres as this uh, situation develops is that it will help facilitate patients being discharged from hospital. So we have a concern at the moment that patients in hospital who start to get better, they are too well for hospital but they're still not well, they still need additional care and this will allow us to care for them in the community by wearing the appropriate protective gear. Okay, that's that's interesting. Um, and it, how does that how does that work with the current opening hours of the COVID nineteen centres? Or would so you we have started with, with eight AM to ten PM, uh, seven days a week. Like I say we have to, we have to start somewhere. If demand ramps up, we may have to increase those hours and we will review that on a day-by-day -day basis. Okay. So then what sort of capacity do you have in, in or will you have in these centres for beds and, and how will you uh, manage social distancing, if at all, within each centre? So as I said, we are trying to do it as a streamlined procedure so patients will be encouraged to wait in their cars. Uh, the centres themselves are being chosen for accommodation of geographical areas that, that allow us to have a walk-in door and a walk-out door, so they are being strategically organised. Okay. So, w will there be beds as such in the COVID centres? If there will be examination facilities, uh, which will involve a bed, and all doctors will also not only have protective equipment, they'll also have surgical scrubs. Uh, they will also have the opportunity to have a shower at the end of the shift, which again will reduce the risk of contamination back to our families. Okay, so if you have a patient who is stepping down from um, emergency care, but not fit enough to go home that you would have in the centre? Would, would we, we won't be looking after them in the centre, okay. but, but we will have a facility to assess them and be able to guide their treatment. And we are working hopefully closely with our home, our home care at home team and our geriatric team so that we can take best advice and coordinate who needs house visits and what appropriate equipment needs to be worn at those house visits. Okay, that's great. Any other questions from the members? Anything from Orlea? We're, We're just checking to see if any of our uh, colleagues remotely have any questions for you, Dr. Dorman. I think. Oh, let's see. No, that's everything. No, I think that's everything. Um, have you any any particular message that you would like to uh, use this opportunity to give to us today, Dr. Dorman? No, I very much appreciate all the support that, that we've been given. Uh, I very much value the public's messages of support. Uh, and it's been remarkable how people have adapted. So, like I say, we've had companies making uh, scrubs. Uh, my own partner, she has a wedding dressmaker who's making herself scrubs out of old sheets. 
Uh, people have been genuinely kind and thoughtful, but we urge people, please heed the public health messages. Please wash your hands. Please stay at home. Thank you very much, Dr. Dorman. I think that's a very um, good message to, to, to end the briefing on. So uh, thank you very much for your, for your time today and wish you all thank the you. best going uh, forward into a very uncertain future. And you have our absolute best wishes uh, for you and your colleagues while you um, help us. So thank you very much for your time today. <laughs>